So on the subject of how to kind of compute these coefficients, I want to you know, be annoying and switch notation a little bit and go back to list notation. So um, yeah. Um, this is the Fourier expansion of a function f of x equals the sum over s, a subset of n, f hat s. And then we can also write here, you know, as I said, you know, parity sub s of x. And this is, uh, well, product i in s x i when x is plus or minus 1 to the n. Uh, I want to go back to now thinking, though, not of this representation, but I want to think of uh, x as being um, a vector of zeros and ones mod 2. OK, and then I need like kind of like a new formula for this. You know, it's quite simple. So uh, if I think of x like this, and I think of f as mapping such vectors of 0, 1 bits into the real numbers, then I'm going to write um, chi sub s for this parity function that maps an n-bit vector into plus or minus 1 in the same way. But now I have to you know, slightly change the formula. Chi sub s of x, I'll write it as product um, i and s of negative 1 to the xi. OK, so this is really the same as the parity function the, uh, on the bits s, except now that I'm switched to using like 0, 1 notation, I have to write minus 1 to the xi rather than just xi. OK? And in fact, once you kind of do this and you start thinking about, OK, how do you actually uh, go from the the values of function to the coefficients in its Fourier expansion, or vice versa, it bears a very strong analogy to what we did last time with the discrete Fourier transform. And I don't really have too much time to dwell on that uh, analogy, but perhaps you'll pick up some of it as we go along. Uh, in fact, in the case where little n is 1, it's exactly the same thing as the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, that's when n is 2. Somehow it's because minus 1 is the 2th root of unity. So now let's do uh, a picture like we were doing last time, in fact. Uh, we've been thinking so far of interpolation. Let's think about uh, the evaluation question again. Let's say I gave you a bunch of um, coefficients for a multilinear polynomial. And I want to know, OK, what's the Boolean function that this is representing? Or like, what is the truth table associated to this uh, multilinear polynomial? Well, in some sense, you just plug in all possible uh, Boolean strings to the polynomial and find out what the 2 to the n values are. Uh, but let's do that using um, matrices again. So let's say I have uh, the Fourier coefficients, or the coefficients of some multilinear polynomial, f hat empty set, f hat 1, f hat to f hat s in general. Maybe the last one is f hat of everything. And I want to get out the values of the function. So it's like f on uh, all zero string, f on 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Uh, f on x in general, f on all ones. OK, I'll switch to this 0, 1, uh, f2 to the n notation again. Uh, well, it's again just a matrix vector multiply. Uh, how do I get f at the all zeros string? If I have uh, 
I guess the Fourier expansion now will look like this. Okay, so this is my Fourier expansion of a Boolean function f. It's a linear combination with these coefficients of these like quote unquote parity functions or XOR functions. And I can get f on the all zero string by just plugging in uh, all zeros here. And this sum will exactly be given by uh, putting chi empty set of all zeros here and then chi empty or chi of one of all zeros okay, through the last one. If I dot that row with that column, I'll exactly get f1 all zeros by this formula. Okay, and then similarly here. Okay, and uh, the general term here is going to be chi sub s of x. This is in the uh, xth row. And this is going to be in the est column. And this is uh, sort of exactly like last time. This is evaluation going from coefficients of a multilinear polynomial to the Boolean function that it's uh, sort of the truth table of the function. And this is just some uh, explicit matrix here. And in our previous scenario, we called this the DFT matrix. And in this case, it's called the, sometimes called the Walsh Fourier transform or the Hadamard Fourier transform. And we'll just call it the Hadamard matrix. And its notation is H sub capital N, where capital N is 2 to the little n. Actually, let me write over here. Uh, <coughs> what is the entries of this in the x row in the s column? Well, it's chi sub s of x, which we know is product over i and s of minus 1 to the xi. And actually, another way you can write this is, um, well, we can interchange these. We get minus 1 to the sum over i and s of xi. This is sort of computing the parity of the bits in x in the subset s mod 2. And then we're taking minus 1 to that. And you might even write this like this. Minus 1 to the sum over all i, 1 to the n, xi, SI mod 2, where I kind of made up some notation here, SI standing for 1 if I is in the set S and 0 if it's not in the set S. If you use that notation, then you actually, it's nice. You see that it's, um, it's a symmetric matrix, actually. Okay, this is all looking a little bit uh, symbol heavy. So let's, as we did last time, like do an actual example when little n is 2. So when n is 2, what is this sort of uh, Boolean Fourier transform matrix? Uh, we got h2 to the 2, or h4. OK, so it's a 4x4 four four matrix. And its columns are indexed by the subsets of the two numbers 1 and 2. And its rows are indexed by the, all the binary strings of length 2. OK, and the entries are going to be plus or minus 1. And uh, what you need to do to compute an entry is you look at what subset of the bits you're talking about here and compute the parity of the bits of the string in that subset. 
and then kind of convert to minus one plus one notation. <coughs> okay, one thing's a little bit annoying here. Uh, the nice way to do it is consider this to be the first column and consider this to be the second column. I know that's a little backwards, but the thing you should really, really do is like instead of indexing your binary strings like position 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to n, you should really uh, do n minus 1, n minus 2 down to 0, like as if they were like, you know, binary digits. That's too annoying. That's too far a step for me, but that's justifying like why you really should ought to like reverse these columns. Anyway, so let's go with it. So uh, in this column, we take uh, the empty set. So the empty set contains nothing. So uh, this column is always plus one. OK, here we just look at the first column, which is this one. So uh, 0 goes to plus 1, 1 goes to minus 1, 0 goes to plus 1, 1 goes to minus 1. Now we look at the second column, which is this one. We get plus 1, plus 1, minus 1, minus 1. And now we look at both columns together. So the parity of these two things is 0, which is, goes to plus 1. Parity of these two things is 1, which goes to minus 1. We get minus 1. And then uh, these things add up to 0 mod 2, so we get plus 1. OK, so finally, this is the matrix H4, this uh, plus, 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 minus, plus, minus, et cetera. OK, and this is a, a, actually a fairly well-known matrix, the Hadamard matrix. It comes up in many contexts other than um, analysis of Boolean functions. So it's good to get to know it. But it's exactly uh, the function, or sorry, the matrix which maps uh, coefficients of a multilinear polynomial to like all the values on the Boolean strings. Um, and it's quite analogous to the uh, DFT matrix we saw last time, except it's even simpler. It has an even much simpler uh, recursive structure. And uh, I leave these to you to check, maybe as exercises. Um, Again, if you let h2 be the smallest example, which turns out to be plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, minus 1. This is the n equals 1 case. This is also dft2, ironically. Um, then in general, h2 uh, to the little n is what's called the Kronecker product of n copies of this little 2 by 2 matrix. Okay, this thing is some kind of uh, matrix product called Kronecker product. Which you should look up on Wikipedia. Uh, basically means you take this matrix, if you just want a Kronecker product with itself once to get here, you take this matrix and like multiply it into this entry and you get plus, 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 minus. And then you multiply into this entry, and you get like plus, 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 minus. And the bottom left entry, and you get plus, 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 minus. And you also multiply it into this entry, and you know, everything gets minus. So you get minus, 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 plus. OK, so as I said, it has like very, I mean, uh, very beautiful properties, very simple recursive structure. And so in fact, just like last time, and even more simply, if you want to do this task of multiplying uh, this matrix, this Hadamard matrix, against some vector of coefficients, C empty set, C1 through C everything. Even though this is a capital N by capital N matrix, you can do this matrix vector multiplication in n log n time. by some simple divide and conquer method. OK, so this gives you how, like, a way to like, simultaneously evaluate a polynomial on all the, the Boolean strings, 2 to the n Boolean strings, and you know, time that's nearly linear in the number of strings, albeit that's 2 to the n strings, 2 to the little n strings. And this is, I guess, called the fast walsh hadamard transform. <coughs> uh, but honestly, we don't um, usually we're not usually doing this, because uh, 2 to the n is usually pretty large. Um, 
Unlike the DFT, we're usually actually doing the DFT in practice. Uh, here it's more for a theoretical interest. OK, so let's prove some more uh, great properties of this uh, matrix. So in fact, just like last time, the, the key property is that uh, any two distinct columns have inner product 0, or dot product 0. And I guess two same columns have inner product n, 2 to the little n. This one's obvious, right? Because this matrix has only plus or minus one entries. So if you dot product a column with itself, you just add up one capital N times. Uh, and I'll show you this property in a second. It's also quite easy. But once we have these two properties, we're actually in the exact same position we were in last time with the discrete Fourier transform. And we can make all the same kind of observations. So in particular, uh, that means like 1 over root n hn is a unitary matrix. Just to remind you, it means it's like a rotation or a reflection. It doesn't change the lengths of any vectors. Uh, you might already think about why that shows for a Boolean valued function, the sum of the squares of the Fourier coefficients is always 1. Uh, another thing this implies is that if you look at um, you know, hn transpose times hn, that's basically the matrix of all the dot products. If you stick a 1 over n in there, you get the identity matrix again. Okay, this fact is basically identical to this proposition. And so just as before, I mean, not worrying too much about the scalar 1 over n, this means that like the inverse of this matrix is the transpose of this matrix. And it's even nicer now. There's no complex numbers and uh, no com complex conjugates. And in fact, this matrix is symmetric. It's, it's uh, easy to show. As I mentioned, it sort of follows from this fact. So this matrix is its own transpose. So in fact, um, you know, H and inverse, uh, which is the interpolation matrix, I'll remind you about that in a second, uh, is, well, 1 over n times hn. OK, so this is the matrix you use if you have just like the kind of like truth table of a Boolean function. It's 2 to the n values listed down in a vector. And you, now you say, oh, I want to get the Fourier coefficients. Well, again, you just multiply by this special matrix h sub n and divide by 1 over n. Yep? Um, with that in mind, the roots of unity seem like a much more elegant generalization of the output space. Does that make sense? Um, of the output space? Yeah, if you were considering three values in your output, then it might be nice to represent them by like complex third roots of unity, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a common generalization of both this setup and the discrete Fourier transform setup when you have a function, this is like an aside, a function from like, I don't know, zm to the n into the complex numbers. And uh, yeah, there's a common generalization that involves roots of unity. This is like the special case where m is 2. And so for because the, the, the second roots of unity are plus or minus 1, then everything is a lot nicer. And it, it's just plus or minus 1s and can take place over the reals and so forth. OK, and so in fact, let me uh, uh, use this deduction to get like a formula for the Fourier coefficients. So if you imagine uh, just putting the truth values here or the function values here to get the Fourier coefficients out, you also need to multiply by 1 over n. You deduce that f hat s equals, uh, well, this 1 over n times the sum over all x of f of x times 
times the matrix entry chi Sx. And actually, I prefer to write this as follows. See, this is the same as 2 to the minus little n. And here we're like summing over all x and also multiplying by the in, 1 over the number of all possible strings. So this is like taking an expectation. So this is the same as taking an expectation over a uniformly random input string. of f of x times this chi s of x. And this is kind of nice because uh, this is a function that you care about. This is the Boolean function f you care about. Remember, this is like the Boolean function which gives you the parity of the s bits of a string x. And this is kind of like saying when you take expectation and multiply, it's sort of like the correlation between these two functions. So it's saying that the Fourier coefficient f hat s Remember, we have this formula. Oh, maybe it's still up there. Yeah, this is the writing f as a polynomial. f hat s is like the coefficient when you write f as like a linear combination of parity functions. f hat s is the coefficient on the parity of the s bits function. This is saying that coefficient is sort of the correlation between f and that parity function. Okay. Any questions? Okay, let me prove this proposition real quickly. Because it'll give us a chance to use this uh, expectation notation. OK, so the inner product of the S and T columns is, well, the sum over all rows of the entry products, x chi Sx times chi Tx. And we kind of want to show that this is 0 when S does not equal T. Well, you can see some examples of it here, but uh, let's prove it. Now, if you want to show that some number equals 0, it's OK to multiply the left-hand side by some constant. And in fact, let's multiply it by 2 to the minus n. That doesn't change the question. And I'll do that because it converts us to this nice expectation notation. So this is true if and only if the expectation for a uniformly random x of the parity of the s bits of x times the parity of the t bits of x equals 0. Now, uh, let's say this is all the coordinates n. So let's say this is s. And let's say this is t, two subsets. Consider the coordinates i in the intersection. These coordinates will show up both here and here. And so you'll get a minus 1 to the xi twice. Okay, so for i in the intersection, you get uh, these factors that look like minus 1 to the 2xi. And well, regardless of whether xi is 0 or 1, this is minus 1 to something even, so it's just 1. Which means that you can take out all these uh, things in the intersection of s and t, and it doesn't change this product. So what you're left with is, uh, well, the symmetric difference of s and t. So it's the expectation of a random Boolean string of the product over i in the symmetric difference, s, symmetric difference t, of minus 1 to the xi. OK, and now there are two cases depending on whether or not this set is empty or not. OK, so if s equals t, which is the same as s symmetric difference t being the empty set, then here you have the empty product. The empty product is by definition 1. So you have the expectation of just uh, 1. 
Or it's like saying, you know, if s equaled t, like everything would cancel out, and you just have a product of a bunch of ones here. So it would give you one. So then you non-randomly have one. OK, and that's actually consistent with the second bullet point there, because I put in this factor of 2 to the minus n, or 1 over capital N. OK, otherwise, uh, you have at least one term here. And uh, here we're choosing a uniformly random Boolean string. And an equivalent way to do that is to just choose each of the bits independently and uniformly. Okay, flip a coin for each bit. Which is to say that the, the values, the bits, whether they're 0 or 1, these are independent uh, events. And so uh, the expectation of a product of independent random variables is the product of the expectation. So you can use that this becomes, it's the product, i in this symmetric difference, of the expected value over a random string x of minus 1 to the xi. And now, I mean, for a given i, Uh, xi is 0, 1 with 50, 50 chance each. So this is minus 1 or plus 1 with 50% chance each. So the expected value, if it's 50, 50 plus or minus 1, is 0. So actually, each of these expectations is 0. So the product is extra 0. So it's 0 whenever s doesn't equal t. Okay. Uh, good. Okay, so I got to give you a little bit more like notation and stuff, and then I'll finally uh, take fifteen or twenty minutes to tell you about some applications of how all this like uh, representing a Boolean function by a polynomial is useful. OK, so this notation is sort of inspired by what's on that far right board. Um, if you have two Boolean functions, uh, I'm going to write something that looks like their inner product. And it's going to basically be like their inner product, but um, divided by 2 to the n. So what I mean is it's this, uh, 2 to the minus n, sum over all x of f of x times g of x. It's like if you lined up their truth tables together, dot product of them, and divided by 2 to the minus n. Or to use this probabilistic notation, it's the expected value of f of x times g of x. Again, this is some kind of like correlation between these two Boolean functions. So this proposition we just finished proving actually showed that uh, two distinct parity functions have this in, uh, correlation being 0. And it's 1 if they're the same. That's actually what this is saying. And this formula over here for the Boolean, uh, for the Fourier coefficients, we can also use uh, the same notation for this. This is saying that f hat s is the sort of inner product or correlation between f and the s parity function. And actually, as an example of this, if I take s to be the empty set, I get that uh, f hat empty set. Which remember, this is the coefficient in the polynomial expansion sitting next to the empty monomial. In other words, it's the constant coefficient. This equals the inner product of f with the constantly one function, which is the expected value of f of x. Or in other words, the average value of the Boolean function. And I sometimes like to think of this like the simplest example of a Fourier coefficient telling you something interesting about a Boolean function. The Fourier coefficient associated to the empty set is the average value of the function, average of the function's values. So if you have a, like a really Boolean valued function that's like plus or minus one valued, um, for example, uh, this Fourier coefficient tells you how biased it is towards uh, plus values or minus values, and in particular it's zero if the function is equally off in plus or minus one. So that's nice. Um,
Another thing is this. If I look at f inner product g, and I replace these two guys by their Fourier expansions, Uh, just like an inner product, this is, this is a linear combination of vectors. This is a linear combination of vectors. I can use linearity. If you don't follow this, it's OK. You can trust me that it's true. Uh, this is sum over st, f hat, s, f, g hat, t, inner product, chi s, chi t. And using this fact, uh, this expression is usually 0, unless they're the same, in which case it's 1. So most of these terms in the double sum drop out, and the only thing we're left with is sum over s, f hat s, g hat s. This is a pretty cool formula, too. This is called Parseval's formula, or Plancherel's formula. It's kind of nice. It says, you know, if you take two Boolean functions, f and g, and sort of stack them up in truth tables and look at their correlation by basically taking a dot product, it's the same, actually, as stacking up their vector of uh, Fourier coefficients and taking the dot product. So how similar the Fourier transforms are is somehow exactly the same as how similar the functions are. Uh, good. <clears throat> OK, and uh, a corollary of this, if you take the inner product of f with itself, well, by definition, this is the average value of f of x, it's the average of the square of the function. And uh, this formula tells you that this is also the sum of the squares of the Fourier coefficients. And in particular, uh, that's one. Sorry. This thing is one if f is a Boolean valued function. Let's remember, these are the functions we care about most. If you think of f as being a function that uh, actually takes on Boolean values, then f of x squared is always 1. So this is always 1, regardless of what Boolean function f is. And this justifies this like, neat fact I told you before, that for a Boolean valued function, the squares of the coefficients always add up to 1. Mm. Actually, there's one other neat thing you can do here. Remember, f hat empty set is the expectation of f. Uh, this is the expectation of f squared. So if I take this and subtract the square of this, I can conclude uh, expectation over x of f of x squared minus expectation of f of x squared which is the variance of x, f, f, has this formula. It's the sum. I take this whole sum and I subtract f hat empty set squared. So it's the sum over all the non-constant coefficients of the squares of the Fourier coefficients. OK, so I bring this up just to say it's like another example of how you can like learn something about like the truth table of a function or a function's values, like its variance, by a simple formula of the Fourier coefficients.